Today, we're jumping back into our series called Real Relationships, and we're dealing with all these different kinds of relationships that we see, not just in life, but that we see in Scripture. So we've talked about singleness, talked about marriage, um, and today we're talking about, I think, a really key relationship that I'll be honest, a lot of us take for granted. And this is a generalization, but I'm going to guess that most of the men in this room, or even online, most of the men struggle with this more than the women, but not necessarily, but as a generalization, that is true. Today, we're talking about friendship. I want to read for you a small account of what one pastor by the name of Stu Weber said when he was training to be, at the time, a U.S. Army Ranger. And he recalls a story that in Fort Benning, Georgia, the raspy voice of his drill sergeant said, men, we are here to save your lives. We're gonna see to it that you overcome all your natural fears. We're gonna show you just how much stress the human mind and body can endure. And when we're finished with you, you will be the U.S. Army's best. He said, though, before he finished his announcement, he said, here's your first assignment. Find yourself a buddy, he growled. You will stick together. You will never leave each other. You will encourage each other. And if necessary, you will carry each other. I wonder who you would pick for a similar assignment. Who do you have in your life who would encourage you, who, who would carry you in the way that he was being asked? See, these are not just buddies. They're friends. Friendship is something that many of us take for granted, and yet the Bible talks a lot about friends. Today, we're going to look at the story of a friendship with David and Jonathan. It's found in 1 Samuel, and every single week, we take God's Word, the Bible, we open it up, and I try my hardest, hopefully driven by the Spirit to do so, to teach God's Word in a way that you find to be understandable. But today we're going to look at 1 Samuel chapter 18 through 23. Don't get nervous. We're not going through all five chapters. But as I think about this story, and we'll get into it in just a second, I thought, what, what a wonderful summary of this whole story found in Proverbs 17. So that's the verse that I would like for us to stand and read together in honor of God who gave us his word. Would you right now, would you stand up with us? We do this every single Sunday. And typically, I read aloud the verse, and you listen, but I want us to all read Proverbs 17, 17 together, and it'll be on the screen right here. So let's all say it together. A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. Let's pray. Father, we come right now to sit under the teaching of your word it's not my word, it's not my opinion that does anything to change a life. It is the word of God with the spirit of God in the people of God where life change happens. Help us, Lord, to be friends in a way that honors you. And we'll pray it in Jesus' name, amen. Amen, you can have a seat. Friends are important. Somebody said, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. Perhaps that's true. Sometimes we say, you know, as a kid, you are what you eat. I have no idea what that means. <laughs> but I do know that you are generally who you hang around. And we can all think of times in our life where maybe we began to hang out with a crowd that wasn't the best for us and it took us a direction we didn't want to go. See, your friends determine, in many ways, your future. Friends are important. We like friendships. I hope that you have friendships. We watch friendships. Think of all the movies and the shows that we watch that deal with friends. It's been fascinating to, to read of kind of our latest generation, Gen Z or whatever you want to call them, uh, who have now been enamored again with the show Friends and are watching that again. In fact, backstage, we were talking about this, and we all started singing this, you know, the theme song. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> You know, so friends, <laughs> and, and for years we've been watching friends on TV, maybe, you know, depending on your generation, maybe there was that quintessential 
friend that just kind of defined friendship for you. You know, back in the day, it was Andy and Barney, right? Or maybe it was, it was uh, the Fonz and Richie. For my generation, there's no more stable friendship than, than Zach and Screech. You, you know that if you're my age, right? right? Or maybe it's Bert and Ernie. You know, whatever, whatever your favorite friendship is, we, we understand at a human level, whether you're a believer in Jesus or not, we, we all understand that friends are important. I read this week of five levels of friends. And as I read this, I thought, you know, this is, this is probably true. And this is what someone said, that there are five levels of friendship. They said, you know, level one, we just are strangers. In other words, I know of you. I don't really know you that well, but we can all point to tons of strangers that maybe we know of, friends of a friend, that kind of thing. We also have number two, acquaintances. Now, I know you. Maybe this is the, the lady down the hall at work or you know, the guy in the house two streets over you know, acquaintances. Number three, we have casual friends. I like you. And hopefully in your life, you have a few people that you like. <laughs> and a few people would say that about you. Number four, close friends. I understand you. And I hope and pray certainly that as a church, we would say that a lot of us uh, at Johnson Ferry, that we are close friends. You know, we're more than just casual friends, we're close friends. But at the fifth and final level, he talks about intimate friends. And by this, he means I connect with you. More than just that we can talk about sports or politics or family or where we're going on vacation this summer, all that kind of stuff that the casual or even close friends talk about. But there, there are these intimate friendships, these, this kind of soul connection that you have with another human being. And I think if you can come through life and have two, three, maybe four of these close friendships, these, these intimate friendships, then you're a blessed person. Some of you right now can think about friends like that. Some of you are probably struggling to think of a friend like that. And while I love the notion that some married couples say where they say, look, my husband is my best friend, my wife is my best friend, I love, I love the sentiment behind that, but sometimes that can be a cop-out because you need other people to spur you along besides your spouse. You, you need close friends in your life. So friendship is a subject that we don't think a whole lot about. We take for granted, and let's be honest, it gets harder the older you get. When you're a kid, you're in school, you're just surrounded with people all the time, and you can easily point out the best friends and my friends and all this kind of thing, but the older you get, the more responsibility you have, the more your world kind of shrinks in a way. And then you throw on top of that social media that tends to divide us. You throw on, that the top that, throw on top of that the fact that a lot of us move every four to five years, harder to put roots down. There, there's all these social factors that's really making it difficult for people in general to have friends. But God talks about friendship. The Bible talks a lot about friendship. And I think in 1 Samuel, we have a beautiful picture of a godly friendship. And I hope that as we go through this text today that you not only hear of the story of David and Jonathan, but that you keep asking yourself, do, do I have a friend like that? A or am I a friend like that? So today is pretty simple. I wanna talk about characteristics of a real friend, of a true friend the kind of friend that God wants us to be and the kind of friend that God wants us to have. Three characteristics I think we see in this beautiful story. Now, you may be new to the Bible, you may not know anything about David and Jonathan, but just a quick little recap might help. So 1 Samuel is all about the people of God wanting a leader, and they pick out Saul. Saul is who you would think the people would pick out. He's tall, he's handsome, and, and he becomes a major problem. See, God didn't even really want them to have a human leader. He wanted them to depend on him, but he gave them a king. And Saul is an abysmal failure. The true king, as we come to find out, is David. And as you read the book of 2 Samuel, you see that, that God, in a way, departs from Saul, and God is now with David. So everything that Saul does becomes a failure. Everything that David does is blessed. Now, David is not a perfect person, but he demonstrates time and time again that God is with him. Now, this will come at great cost to him. Saul is, is fueled with jealousy. After all, when David killed Goliath, the, the women, it said, would sing that Saul has killed his thousands, but David his tens of thousands. And jealousy fueled the rage of 
Saul. So much so that he sought to put David to death. In fact, if you read 1 Samuel, we see at least five, if not six or seven occasions where Saul tried to kill David. So the the most, most unlikely alliance forms in 1 Samuel 18 because David becomes a soul friend, uh, an intimate friend with the most unlikely person on the planet, Saul's son, Jonathan. So I want you to see their story today and I want you to think about what made their friendship special, what set it apart. And we wanna think about, am I that kind of friend or do I have these kind of friends in my life? So I want you to see three characteristics. Here's the first one we'll talk about. That a real friend, according to God, a real friend is a kindred spirit. A kindred spirit. Now that word kindred is an old fashioned word. We think about your next of kin, a family member. And that's what we're talking about. Someone who's like family, maybe even closer than family. Notice in 1 Samuel 18, one through five, we're gonna kind of skip around a good bit today. So I hope you'll have your Bibles out and read along with me. I'll have it on the screen. If you don't have a Bible in front of you, 1 Samuel 18, one through five, this is how they met David and Jonathan. Now it came about when he had finished speaking to Saul, that's David, that Jonathan committed himself to David and Jonathan loved him as himself. And Saul took him that day, that's David, and he did not let him return to his father's house. Then here's where it gets unlikely, verse three. Then Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was on him and gave it to David with his military gear, including his sword, his bow, and his belt. And David went into battle wherever Saul sent him and always achieved success. So Saul put him in charge of the men of war and it was pleasing in the sight of all the people and also in the sight of Saul's servants." The way the New American Translation, uh, Bible translates it in verse one is that Jonathan committed himself to David. Uh, your translation may say that his soul was knit to David's. And that's a beautiful picture. Think about thread woven between two pieces of fabric, knitting them together. That in some ways, the soul of Jonathan and the soul of David were, they were knit together in a special kind of way. They were kindred spirits. Maybe they had an immediate connection. Maybe you've had a friend like that that you weren't even looking for, but you found one. He just had so many things in common. They just became a sure and fast and wonderful friend. That's what we see here with David and Jonathan. Now, on the surface, this makes sense because they did have some things in common. I think Jonathan and David were, they were, they were a man's man, both of them. They were tough. They were warriors. If you read 1 Samuel 14, it says that that there was a time in which the Philistines had overtaken Israel. They had taken all the weapons from Israel. There were only two swords left in Israel. One was owned by Saul, the other was owned by his son, Jonathan. And without even telling his father, Jonathan took his sword and he and his sword bearer went up and they defeated with their own hands, 20 Philistine soldiers. So this is a man of incredible courage, A man who knows how to fight, he's a warrior, he's a soldier. David, of course, is a soldier. Maybe an unlikely one, the runt of the litter in his family of brothers. But David is the one who destroys and defeats Goliath. We know that story. That story is as much about the courage of David as it is just the hand of God. Like David should not have beaten Goliath. That makes no sense except for God was with him. But both of these men knew how to fight and maybe they just had a common affinity having experienced great, great trials and great victories with the Lord. And Jonathan does the most unlikely of things. He he makes a covenant with David. Now that doesn't just mean that he became a good friend, but he literally gave up the rights that he would have had as the son of the king, and he laid them down to David. It, it tells us in verse three that he, he gave up all kinds of things. What does it say? It says that he gave up, for instance, uh, he gave up his, he stripped himself of his robe, verse four, his military gear, his sword, his bow, his belt, He gave all these things to David. This this was a symbolic way of him saying, I'm gonna take off my identity 
as the heir to the throne, and I'm going to give them to you, for you are the rightful heir to the throne. So he's making a covenant with David, and they become kindred spirits. This would be important because Jonathan would protect David's life. As you read all of Sir Samuel, you see that again and again, David is spared. Now, David's not perfect. He makes mistakes. He's a sinner like me, like you. But God is with David, and Jonathan is a gift to David to protect him and his life. They're kindred spirits. Do you have someone in your life like that? A kindred spirit? Someone whom you would say is, is like family, maybe even closer than family. Again, I, I think if you have two, three people in your whole life like that, that's a blessing. But do you have someone in your life like that, a true kindred spirit? We now shift over to chapter 19 and then to 20. And I want you to see another characteristic that emerges from this text. Not only was Jonathan a kindred spirit to David, but secondly, he was an encouraging voice. An encouraging voice. We pick up the story in verse one of chapter seven. Now you need to know that at this point, Saul has already tried to kill David once. And Jonathan's faced with a difficult choice. Do I protect my friend? Or do I show loyalty to my father? And I want you to see in a few of the verses that we're gonna read, and we're gonna kind of skip around a little bit, that at time and time again, Jonathan is an encouraging voice to David. So let's start to read um, a few verses here, and then we'll go to chapter 20, verse one through seven of chapter 19. Now Saul told his son Jonathan and all his servants to put David to death, but Jonathan, Saul's son, greatly delighted in David. So Jonathan informed David saying, my father Saul is seeking to put you to death. Now then, please be on your guard in the morning and stay in a hiding place and conceal yourself. See, he's protecting David, verse four, or three. And as for me, I will go out and stand beside my father in the field where you are hiding and I will speak with my father about you and whatever I find out, I will tell you. Then Jonathan spoke well of David, to his father Saul and said to him, may the king not sin against his servant David since he has not sinned against you and since his deeds have not been very, have been very beneficial to you, verse five. And he gives the reasons for he, meaning David, he took his life in his hand and he struck the Philistine and the Lord brought about a great victory for all Israel. You saw it and rejoiced. Why then would you sin against innocent blood by putting David to death for no reason? Saul listened to the voice of Jonathan and he vowed as the Lord lives, David shall not be put to death. And then Jonathan called David, and David told him all these words, and Jonathan brought David to Saul, and he was in his presence as before. No one has the right to question the king, unless you're the son of the king. And he talked some sense into his father Saul. Why, why, Dad, why would you put this guy to death? I mean, he, he brought you defeat. No other man could defeat Goliath, and he brought you to, why would you want to put him to death Has he done anything to sin against you? And for whatever reason, Saul came to reason that it was not right to put David to death. And that lasted for maybe an hour. (laughs) Because as you read the rest of chapter 19, Saul goes back on his word. And yet again, jealousy and envy fuel this rage and he wants to put him to death. So again, Jonathan's put in this conundrum. Do I support my father? or do I support David? See how he was an encouragement to David. Now go to verse 20, excuse me, chapter 20. I want you to get another snapshot of this. We're gonna read several verses here. David is worried, and he comes up with a plan with Jonathan for how Jonathan can protect him. And just just notice the friendship here. Just get a snapshot as I read a couple of these verses. Chapter 20, verse eight through 11. David says this to Jonathan, deal kindly with your servant, for you have brought your servant into a covenant of the Lord with you. But if I'm guilty of wrongdoing, kill me yourself. In other words, hey, hey, I'd rather my best friend kill me if I've done something wrong. For why then should you bring me to your father? Now hear the encouragement of Jonathan, verse nine. Jonathan said, far be it from you, for if in fact I learn that my father has decided to inflict harm on you, 
Would I not inform you? Then David said to Jonathan, who will inform me if your father answers you harshly? Jonathan said to David, come and let's go out into the field. So both of them went out to the field. So they're still talking. If you go down to verse 13, listen to the incredible loyalty that Jonathan makes to David, not just for his life, but for even the generations that would come after Jonathan. Verse 13, if it pleases my father to do you harm, may the Lord do so to me and more so if I fail to inform you and send you away so that you may go in safety and may the Lord be with you as he has been with my father. And if I am still alive, will you not show me the faithfulness of the Lord so that I do not die? And you shall never cut off your loyalty to my house, not even when the Lord cuts off every one of the enemies of David from the face of the earth. So Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David, saying, may the Lord demand it from the hands of David's enemies. And Jonathan made David vow again because of his love for him, because he loved him as he loved his own life. If we just hit pause on the story, one of the fascinating things about this book is that if you read 2 Samuel, there is a time where David repays Jonathan for his loyalty and how he treats his heir, uh, Mephibosheth. Say that five times fast, 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 fast. I won't even, I'm gonna do it again, I got it one time, I'm not gonna mess it up. So he, he does show that loyalty to him. Now go to verse 30, because I want you to see that, that for Jonathan, this wasn't just a, hey, can I be around my buddy, but this came at a great cost, even to his own life. Look what happens in verse 30 through 34. After finding out, by the way, that he had protected David, this is what happens, verse 30. Saul's anger burned against Jonathan and he said to him, you son of a perverse, rebellious woman. Do I not know that you are choosing the son of Jesse to your own shame and to the shame of your mother's nakedness? For as long as the son of Jesse lives on the earth, neither you nor the kingdom will be established Now, Paul's there, think about that. He's saying, Jonathan, you're giving up everything for this friend of yours. You're giving up your your inheritance. You're giving up the right to the throne. You're giving up fame and glory that comes from being the king. You're you're giving up all that I have given you for this, this son of Jesse. What would happen? Now then, in verse 31, send men and bring him to me, for he is doomed to die. But Jonathan replied to his father Saul and said to him, why must he be put to death? What has he done? Listen to this. Saul hurled his spear at him to strike and to kill him. So Jonathan knew that his father had decided to put David to death. Real quick, that's just like a blinding flash of the obvious, isn't it? I mean, it's like, you hurled a spear at me. All right, I think I know where my father stands on this position. All right, so verse 34, Jonathan got up from the table in the heat of anger He didn't eat food on the second day of the new moon because he was worried about David since his father had insulted him. Go down to verse 41. We'll end this chapter here. After this little plan they'd worked out with shooting some arrows, you you can look at that. Verse 41 says this. When the boy was gone, David got up from the south side and he fell on his face to the ground and he bowed three times. And they kissed each other and they wept together and David wept immeasurably. Then Jonathan said to David, go in safety since we have sworn to each other in the name of the Lord saying, the Lord will be between me and you and between my descendants and your descendants forever. So David set out and went on his way while Jonathan went into the city. It's unfortunate, but I do feel like I have to at least comment on what many people read back into the story. They they see the, the kissing and the weeping and the loving and they sometimes infer onto this relationship that it was somehow inappropriate. But the reality is that the Bible doesn't say anything close to that. I mean, this this kiss is a holy kiss. It was more cultural than anything else. These, These are men who love each other. They love each other as friends. And some of the reasons that we read that back into the story is because, honestly, we have such a low view of what a true friend could be that we can't even imagine that these two men could love each other in a friendly way as they do here. I love that Jonathan, again and again, just encourages his friend. Someone said that the definition of encourage is to put courage into someone. And I just wonder, are you an encourager to others? John Maxwell calls this the elevator principle, that there are some people in your life who bring you up, and there are some people in life who bring you down. Do you know people in your life 
who bring you up? Do you know people in your life who bring you down? In fact, if they're here this morning, let's just point them out. Who in here <laughs> brings people, just kidding. We, we, li- we live in such a world of, of cynicism, trying to catch people, we're so sarcastic towards one another, and, and we just sometimes forget the power of encouragement and even our words. Blaise Pascal is a philosopher, and <laughs> I think this is such a true statement. He said this, I set this down as fact, that if all men knew what each other said of the other, there would not be four friends in the world. <laughs> and that was before Twitter. I mean, amazing, <laughs> just to think what he would say today. Encouragement, the power of encouragement. I can think about people in the New Testament like Barnabas, who was such an encourager to Paul, who used to be the number one persecutor of the church, and now he's this apostle, and Barnabas encouraged Paul and brought him into the fellowship. We need encouragers in life like that, right? Jonathan was an encourager. Are you an encourager? Do you defend your friends? Are you loyal? Do you have a person in your life, you jump on a plane right now and go be with them if they needed you right now? Do you you have these kind of friends in your life? So today we're looking at the marks of a real friend and I think they are there. There's a kindred spirit that's there. There's an encouraging voice. But this third point is really important, especially as a believer. I call it this. I say that it has a yielded heart, a yielded heart. And, and by this, what I'm trying to communicate is that these aren't just friends that any human being can have, but, but God is in the center of these friendships, that there's a yieldedness to the Lord and then a yieldedness to one another. Skip over to chapter 23, and I want you to hear a phrase. This is the last time that, that we know of that David and Jonathan would ever meet, at least it's recorded. And in verse uh, 15 of chapter 23, again, after David's been on the run and Saul's been pursuing him, we see that Jonathan comes to the rescue once again, verse 15. Now, David saw that Saul had come out to seek his life while David was in the wilderness at Ziph, at Horesh. And Jonathan, here he is, Jonathan, Saul's son, set out and went to David at Horesh and encouraged him in God. Now, that is more literally put, he strengthened his hand in God. He encouraged him in God. And he said to him, do not be afraid because the hand of Saul, my father, will not find you and you will be king over Israel and I will be second in command to you and Saul, my father, knows that as well. So the two of them made a covenant before the Lord and David stayed at Horesh while Jonathan went to his house. See, this is so important because I think that you can have close friendships with people who aren't also Christians but you can't have a true intimate friendship with someone who else who is not also yielded to God. In fact, that's what's crazy about the Christian life is that we can travel around the world as we love to do at Johnson Ferry. We minister all over the world. Every single country we can go to, we try to go to. And we can go across the world and meet people that we've never met. And because we are both Christians, we have a bond that sometimes is closer than even our family bonds of people who aren't Christians in our families. And that's what Jesus does. He he seals us together. He knits us together in the most amazing way. And we need friends in life like that who are also yielded to the things of God, yielded to the things of the Spirit, spurring us on to be the people that Jesus wants us to be. The first man, at least that we know of, that that reached the the peak of Mount Everest was uh, Edmund Hillary. He's from England. He did it with with a Sherpa by the name of Tenzing Norgay. And you can see a picture here of them hiking up Mount Everest, and you see a rope that connects the two of them. They call this short roping. On the more dangerous parts of the hike, the person at the top would find an anchor point so the other person can then hike up to them, and they would do this again and again, getting up the mountain together. And that is a picture of what we need in the Christian life, people who spur us along, people who might be a little further than us, and they anchor us in God, and they help pull us up, and Lord willing, hopefully we are that person for someone else, that we pull them up a little bit by little, anchoring them in the things of God, challenging one another. We need friends who are graceful. We need friends who also speak the truth to us. Sometimes we need friends who will challenge us, amen? 
Friends who will say, the way you are doing this is not the way that pleases the Lord. The direction that you are going is not the way God wants you to go. Walk in this way towards the Lord. That's what a friend who has yielded to God does. That's what's so dangerous about marrying someone who's not also a Christian. Because you are both not yielded to God. Proverbs 27 says, faithful are the wounds of a friend, but deceitful are the kisses of an enemy. That first half, faithful are the wounds of a friend. Do you have friends like that? I, I can't tell you the value that friends have had to me in this last year, this crazy year of COVID. I have a group of about six to eight pastor friends from all over the country, and we talk, I think, every single day, either through a text message or an app that we use with videos. Sometimes we've gotten together, we've had little trips together we've done. I can't tell you what a life-saving group of friends that has been over this crazy last year. Do you have a group of friends like that? It's why community is so important. Being with others is so important. I'm so grateful for many things about Johnson Ferry. The sports and fitness ministry this last year has been incredible. Putting people together, we participated in that. Terica and I, my wife, were coaching a little first through third grade softball team. Pray for us, they've been incredible. It's been great. I've played sports, I, I played kickball, that's been fun. Our team won the volleyball championship the other night, that was awesome. Yeah. Unless you saw it, then it wasn't awesome, but we did win, that was good. We had a good time doing that. I mean, it's all the, and our staff team have made some incredible friendships. These, these friends have been a lifesaver to me. Do you have friends like that? Who are also yielded to the things of God? That's what a true friend is. You know, we're almost done, but I, I, I can't help but just miss this opportunity just to think about a picture like this. This is, you know, a key, simple key, grabbed it walking out of the house this morning. And, and what if I said this key has the power to unlock what's inside of you, the real you, not, not that fake you that you want everyone to believe where you always have it all together, you always have the answers, everything's just fine. I'm talking about the real you, the real you where there are hurts, frustrations, insecurities, that's the real you. And, and I'll be honest, I don't want a lot of people to see that about me. You don't either. But there needs to be at least a handful of people who have a key with access to the real you. A key. You know, people who are kindred spirits. People who are encouraging voices. People who are yielded to God. K-E-Y. People who are a key to you. And I wonder... If I gave this assignment and said, I want you to give this key to someone who has access to you. And here's one catch, you can't be related to them. Who would you give this to? Do you know right now? Or would you struggle to come up with a name? If you struggle to come up with a name, then I want you to think about a couple things this morning. How do we get started to be these kinds of friends? Well, here's a couple things I'd give to you. Number one, ask God for a real friend. Make this a matter of prayer. God, I'm struggling with friendships. I would love to have a friendship like I see in David and Jonathan. Would you provide me a friend like that in my life? These kinds of prayers. Number two, put friendship on your calendar. You put other things that are important on your calendar, work stuff. Put friendship on your calendar. Make time for this. It's gonna take intentionality on your part. It's not just gonna happen. And number three, be the friend you want to have. Sometimes I think, well, I'd love to have a friend like that, but I don't have one. And I've, I've tried, I just, you know, I, I can't find one. No one's come up to me and be a friend like that to me. And we so often think, how can I have a friend like that? And I would just challenge you to say, look, have you tried to be a friend like that to somebody? You'd be amazed if you will be that kind of friend how many times you will discover that you can have that kind of friend. And one thing I love about all this is that we're not just talking to people generally about friendships generally, but there, there is a wonderful Christian friendship that exists in Christ. 
Because Jesus is our friend, amen? John 15 says this. How about we let Jesus have the last word here? John 15 says the following. He says, I no longer call you servants because a servant doesn't know his master's business. Look at this word. Now you say it with me. Instead, I have called you friend. No, no, say it again. Instead, I have called you friend. Yeah, why? Because for everything I learned from my father, I have made known to you. You didn't choose me, but I chose you. He's talking about his, his disciples. He chose them. He sent them out. And what did he do? He, he appointed them so they might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And so whatever you ask in my name, my Father will give to you. And this is my command, love each other. We have a friend in Jesus. When he died on the cross for our sins, when he defeated death and the resurrection, and he made it possible that anyone who wants can be saved, yes, he is our Savior, yes, he is our Lord, but what's awesome about Jesus is that he's also our friend. And he can walk with you and be beside you and comfort you and be your friend. I wanna challenge you today. Be the kind of friends that you wanna have. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for who you are. You're a good God, you're a loving God. We thank you for Jesus, for the friendship that we have in him. And I pray, Lord, that there's anyone here today who's never given their life to Jesus, never truly turned from their sin and be given the righteousness that only comes from Christ, would today be that day that they are saved? Lord, would you forgive them? Would you change them? Would you use them? God, for all of us, I pray that we would have these kind of friends in life that could help us to be the people that you want us to be, to spur each other on, to be these kindred spirits, to be these encouraging voices with these yielded hearts that help us to be who you want us to be. Father, we love you, we thank you. Thank you for Jesus, who is a lot of things to us, but one of those things is that he is our friend. So thank you, Lord Jesus. We love you, we pray in Jesus' name, amen and amen.